Father God, Lord, we come before you this morning and we ask that you will watch over us. We ask, Lord, that you will be with us. We ask for your presence to manifest among us this morning. And we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you will speak from your word into our hearts and our minds, that you will open it up our hearts and minds to be able to receive what it is you're saying, to be able to grasp it and understand it and take ownership of it, that we will be changed by it, that it will have impact and effect in our lives. Father, we pray that as we hear your word, that we respond to your word, and we live in a way that glorifies and honors you. Father, we, we ask simply that you will do as you have promised, that you will draw near to us as we seek to draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, in all my excitement, I got a little ahead of myself. A couple of prayer requests that I am going to make you aware of and ask you to keep in your prayers this week. Uh, please be praying for Margaret Phillips uh, on the 9th, which is Tuesday. Uh, Margaret will be having um, an upper endoscopy, uh, dealing with some pancre pancreatic uh, issues. So please keep Margaret Phillips lifted up in your prayers. And also, please be keeping David and Kathy Craver in your prayers. Kathy was taken to the ER last night. Uh, she has some upper respiratory uh, things going on. She has a virus called para-influenza 3. And uh, apparently it was making it difficult for her to breathe. So they're a little under the weather. She's got a bad cough. Uh, just keep, be keeping them in your prayers, all right? All right. So we are picking up young people. Young people can be dismissed for junior church. I always forget that part. Okay, we are picking up this morning where we left off last week. Last week we began a sermon of series on the, the steps of salvation, if you will. Uh, we uh, talked about our need that before a person can uh, make a choice to give their life to Christ, before they can respond to Christ, the person first needs to hear the gospel message, the good news of who Christ is and what he has done for us. And not only do they need to hear, but the person needs to come to a place where they believe. And we talked about the biblical idea of belief. It's more than just saying, yeah, I think something is true, but it is buying in. It is giving oneself to the truth that we believe. And we're moving on this morning and going to focus on the next step in the salvation process, that being the step of repentance. So if you would, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And as you're turning there, I'm just going to kind of try to set the stage for uh, where we're going to pick up in, in the text. It is the day of Pentecost. Uh, Jesus has, has been crucified. He's been resurrected. And he has ascended back to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. It tells us in Scripture that Jesus is there now. Uh, it tells us in, in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John that he is preparing a place for us. Numerous times in Scriptures we're told that he is there interceding for us. And so the Lord has gone back to heaven, to the right hand of the Father. And he has given instruction to his disciples to go back to Jerusalem and to wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit that was going to be poured out on him. And the disciples have, in fact, done that. And here in Acts chapter 2, that is, in fact, what happens. The day of Pentecost comes as they are gathered and they are praying. The Holy Spirit falls from, from heaven and fills each of the disciples. Tongues of fire cover their heads. There was a mighty rushing wind. It drew a crowd and Peter has then the opportunity to address the crowd and to preach the very first gospel message about Jesus Christ. He makes it clear to the Jews that 
Jesus is the Son of God. He, he talks about um, that, that God would not allow his Holy One to see decay, that God had raised him from the dead, that what they were seeing was the fulfillment of the prophecy in the, uh, pro the, of the book of Joel, that in the end days God would pour out his Spirit. And as he kind of brings this message to a crescendo and kind of ending his message with a, you know, really this is the bottom line moment in Acts 2.36, Peter makes this statement, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so he has made it known who Jesus is. He has made it known what God has done through him. The people are two steps into what we are talking about as the steps of salvation. They have heard the gospel message and clearly they have come to a place of belief because it says in Acts 2.37, the very next verse, when the people heard this, heard what? That God has made this Jesus whom they had crucified, both Lord and Christ. When they heard Peter's message, the gospel message, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. See, they, they wouldn't have been cut to the heart if they hadn't believed. But they were. And so they are cut to the heart, they're convicted, and it says then, they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? See, they had heard, they had believed, and now they were looking for a way to respond. What is the right way for us to respond? What should we do? What's the next step? What do we have to do to connect with God and to be forgiven? And Peter's response then in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there's a whole lot in Acts 2.38 to unpack. There are three different things that a person needs to do that is kind of encapsulated there in Acts 2.38. And we're going to cover all of them over the next three weeks. But the one we're going to focus on this morning is the very first thing that Peter says. Repent. Okay. So what does that mean? What does it mean to repent? Obviously, if you give somebody a command, they need to understand what that command is or that instruction is. Now, if I were to tell you this afternoon, I am the great King Puba. I, I get to tell you all what to do. And so I'm giving you this, this instruction, this command. Go home and field day your house. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you understand that instruction and what that means? Perry does. Anybody else? Mike, I know you know it. You just field day. Go home and field day your house. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Okay, in the Marine Corps, when we had to clean up, when we had to set the barracks right and clean our rooms and get everything squared away, they called it field day. Now, if I say go field day your house and you don't know what that means, you're going to go, I don't know what to do. So it's imperative that if there's going to be an instruction given, you understand what the instruction is, right? Right? And so, as Scripture tells us that the first thing we need to do in response to hearing the gospel message and believing the gospel message, the first thing we need to do is repent. Well, what in the world does that mean? The NIV Dictionary <clears throat> defines repentance in this way. It says, repentance is a profound change of mind 
involving the changing of the direction of life from a self-centeredness or a sin-centeredness to a God-centeredness. The basic meaning of the word repent is to cease your current activity, to arrest your current momentum along the path that you are on, to turn, set a new course, and proceed along that new course. Repentance is leaving the way we are currently living and beginning to live in a new and different way. And it's vitally important that we understand what repentance really is. Because there are a lot of things today that are called repentance or are mistaken for repentance that are not truly repentance. I read a story about a man who, after a lot of soul searching and wrestling with his, himself, decided to send a check to the government for back taxes that he had knowingly owed and not paid. And so he sent a check to the IRS with this note attached. He said, I felt so guilty for cheating on my taxes. I had to send you this check. And if I don't feel any better, I'll send you more. <laughs> That's not repentance. That's guilt. Repentance, I've heard it said, repentance isn't when you cry. Repentance is when you change. There is a world of difference between feeling guilty or feeling ashamed and true repentance. They're not the same thing. Guilt or shame would say, I feel bad for the thing that I've done, the wrong, I recognize that I've done something wrong and I feel bad that I did that wrong thing. Repentance says, I recognize I've done wrong. I recognize that I have sinned and I am making the deliberate decision and commitment to change, to stop doing things my way and rather start doing things God's way. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7.10 that there is such a thing as a godly sorrow. And he says that godly sorrow brings repentance, which leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Now, am I saying that you shouldn't feel bad, that we shouldn't feel something, that there shouldn't be an emotional response when we are in the place where we need to repent? I absolutely am not saying that. It's evident in Scripture that those who needed to repent had an emotional response to it. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, as you read about uh, the prophet Nathaniel confronting David after his sin with Bathsheba, and he lays out for him the egregiousness of David's transgression and sin. What's David's response? He's heartbroken. And he cries out before God for forgiveness. In John 16... Verses 8 through 9, Jesus tells us that part of the work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So yes, when we have done wrong and we are being convicted of that wrong, it's appropriate that we feel sorry, that we have sorrow over the wrong thing that we have done. 
But real repentance requires not just a feeling of guilt, not just a a regret over the wrong we've done, but a change in our action and behavior. The best illustration I can think of this uh, is this. A number of years ago, my dad and I were going fishing together. We were going down to Penns Creek in Central County, uh, in Center County, and we were, we were coming up to the little town of Coburn. And there, as you come into Coburn, you come to an intersection, and you, can, you have to turn one, left or right, one way or the other. And Dad told me, we get down here to this light, turn left. I said, okay, and immediately turned right. And, and started going the wrong way. I was heading west on Route 45. Now, immediately I knew I had done wrong. Immediately I knew I went the wrong way. But repentance required more from me than me simply saying, oh man, I'm sorry, Dad. I shouldn't have turned right. I was supposed to turn left. Repentance required more from me than saying, gee, I wish I hadn't done that. Now we're heading for State College instead of heading for where we need to go. See, repentance, for repentance to happen, what was required was that I stop the truck, turn around and go back in the direction that my father had instructed me to go. That is repentance. And that physical illustration is what is supposed to take place in us spiritually when we repent. It's more than recognizing that we've done wrong or feeling sorry that we've done wrong or regretting the wrong we've done. Repentance requires changing the way we live. Secondly, we need to understand that God himself is who calls us to repentance. God himself calls us to repentance. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 30 through 32, the Lord says, Therefore, O house of Israel, I will judge you, each one of you, According to his ways, declares the sovereign Lord. Repent. Turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. Rid yourself of all the offenses you have committed. And get a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Sovereign Lord. Repent and live. In the New Testament, as Paul is preaching his message in the the Mars Hill message in Acts chapter 17, he's preaching before the Areopagus, and he says to the people in Acts 17.30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. And he's talking about all of the idol worship and the worshiping of these these false gods that was going on in the city of Athens. He says, in the past, God overlooked that, but now God commands, he commands, God, he's talking about, now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And throughout scripture, we see God's appointed representatives commanding and pleading on God's behalf for his people to turn away from sin and return to him. Think about how frequently repentance is a a central part of what God is commanding and calling out to the people. As God sent his representative in preparation for Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist came, and in in Matthew 3, 1 through 2, it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judah 
and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's interesting, isn't it? That John's message is repent for the kingdom of God is near. Not rejoice. Isn't that interesting? Isn't the coming of the kingdom of God reason to rejoice and celebrate? But John's message wasn't rejoice. It was repent. And then we see the exact same thing in Jesus' ministry. When Jesus began to preach, it says in Matthew chapter 4. So this is just one chapter later. It says in verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's interesting that they both use the exact same words. They are both communicating the exact same message. Which tells me that repentance is a central component to inclusion in the kingdom of God. Both Jesus and John the Baptist, as they are sharing this news that God's kingdom is drawing near. What they are saying for the people to do is repent. I think that should speak pretty loudly to us. In fact, Jesus says in Luke, 15, or Luke 5, verse 32, he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And notice the, the choice of words here. Notice, I think often it, it is significant what is not said as much as what is said. Here's what I mean by that. Notice that he did not choose to wor use words like this. I have not come to call the righteous, but call sinners to forgiveness. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I have come to call sinners to salvation. Or I have come to call sinners to eternal life. He doesn't say that. Now does that mean that Jesus doesn't offer forgiveness, salvation, or eternal life? Of course not. We all know that he's promised us those things in him. But notice that he says, I've come to call them to repentance. See, repentance comes first. Repentance is essential before the other things can become realities for us. Before we can be forgiven, before we can have salvation, before we can have eternal life, repentance has to happen. In Luke 24, verses 46 through 47, Jesus says, he told them, this is what is written, <clears throat> excuse me, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So he says repentance and forgiveness of sin. And again, note the order. Repentance first. Forgiveness after. That's significant. The Apostle Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, if we're going to not perish, if we're going to be saved, we have to come to repentance. As I thought about that, and an illustration for that, I was reminded of a story um, I, I get the picture when, when it talks about God 
calling us to repentance. I get the picture of a, a parent pleading with their child not to make decisions that they know are going to be harmful or, or destructive. And I remember a story that I, I saw on a, a video of this young boy, 10, 11 years old, and he had a very defiant kind of spirit. He just, he, he didn't listen. And he and his father, they're in Africa. They're, they're somewhere out on the Serengeti in Africa. And the boy started walking out of the camp and away from where his father was. And his father's pleading with him, come back, get back here, stop, come here. And the boy is ignoring him. There was something he wanted to go see, something he, he, he wanted to go investigate. But what the boy didn't understand was his father could see over here there was a lion charging, racing to get to the boy. And he's pleading with his son, come back. And the boy didn't listen. And the lion got him. Apparently that was a true story. But I think so much that is so true of us spiritually. You know, we're reaching for things and we're trying to get involved in things and we're chasing stuff and we're, get, we're doing things and God is saying, please don't. Stop. Come back. You're going to get hurt. That thing is going to, to, to scar you. That thing is going to cripple you. That thing is going to ultimately destroy you. Stop. And so God pleads and calls us to repentance, to stop chasing after and reaching for the things that will hurt us and instead turn to him and reach for him. So first, a person needs to repent. Secondly, they need to, uh, they need to understand repentance, excuse me. Secondly, they need to understand that it is God who calls us to repentance. And finally, we need to recognize our personal need for repentance. Our personal need for repentance. Now, I got to tell you, I, excuse me, I struggled quite a bit with whether or not to say what I am about to say. I, I really wrestled with whether or not it was appropriate for me to say it, but I, I feel... I feel compelled to say this to you. Frequently over the last handful of years, I have been criticized for preaching what many would consider to be hard truths of Scripture. Um, I have been asked questions like, why do you preach so often about sin? Johnny, why don't you focus more on the encouraging verses of the Bible and not the things that a person might, visiting here, might leave and, and feel bad about? I have been basically told that my approach to preaching is ungracious and unloving. And I'm not saying any of this to boo-hoo poor Johnny, people criticized me. What I'm trying to say to you, what I'm pleading with you to understand is this. I will never avoid or step over hard truths in God's word in order to avoid hurting anybody's feelings or stepping on somebody's toes, I will never stop preaching the need for us to recognize our sin and turn from it, seeking God's grace and forgiveness. And here's why. Here is the bottom line, and I hope that you will write this in your, your sermon notes. Salvation is not possible without repentance. Salvation is not possible 
without repentance. It is only as you and I recognize and own our identity as a sinner. And only as we repent of our sinful way of living life that will lead to us turning to God and therefore open the door for him to pour his grace into our lives through Jesus Christ. And we will receive from him then forgiveness and salvation. Without repentance, that door remains closed. And the truth is, I preach about sin and repentance not because I want to beat anybody up. Not because I get some power trip out of taking God's word and using it like a club to beat on you. I detest that. I detest that kind of preaching. And that's not who I want to be. I preach about sin and repentance not because I want to make you feel guilty or feel discouraged. And I certainly don't preach on these things so that I can stand on some moral spiritual soapbox and look down on somebody else and judge anybody else because I am the chief of all sinners. And I know how guilty I am. I am no better than anyone, worse than most. But I preach on sin and I preach the need to repent. Because I love you. Because I know what it's like. I've, I've been there. And I know the pain and the hurt and the damage that sin has done in my life. I know the scars. I carry them still. And I don't want that for any of us. But the only way to enjoy the peace and the blessing of salvation relationship with God through Jesus, the only way that happens is if we are willing to recognize and own our identity as a sinner. Not that we sin sometimes, but that I am a sinner. That's who I am. That's what I am in my humanity outside of Jesus Christ. I am a sinner. And I believe that that identity as a sinner is becoming more and more difficult for people to be able to hear and to accept these days. Because we live in a society where anything goes and we're told from a very young age that it's okay for you to be different. It's okay for you to walk away from the moral teachings of your parents and your grandparents because they just don't understand. And it's okay for you to go outside of what they say is right or wrong or normal. It's okay for you. I'm okay, you're okay. Nobody else can tell you how to live life. Anybody who says that what you're doing is wrong, they're bigoted, they're hateful, they're judgmental. And we're inundated with that. Our children hear an endless, an endless stream of that kind of teaching. And so then when they're confronted with the truth of God's word that we are in fact sinners, it's something that people are becoming less and less willing and less and less able to hear and to accept because it goes against everything they're hearing in, so, in our culture and society and media. But the truth is that we are sinners and we do need to repent. Psalm 53 verses two through three, God looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand any who seek God. 
everyone is turned away. They have together become corrupt. There is no one good, not even one. Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So because we are sinners, because we have all and all have and all do make sinful choices, our sin separates us from God. And it's only as we choose to repent and turn back to God that we can be made right with God through Jesus. Each of us needs to own our identity as a sinner and needs to repent. Furthermore, we need to understand that repentance isn't just a one-time decision. Yes, there is an initial decision that I am going to stop going my way and begin to live God's way. Yes, we have that, one, that, that moment. But repentance is a lifestyle of constantly course correcting in order to bring ourselves back into the direction our Heavenly Father wants us to go. It's not a one-time thing. We have to live it every moment of every day. If you've ever driven a boat, if you've ever been the one piloting a boat, whether it's a tiller or whether it's a steering wheel, whichever way you control the boat, you know that there's like a thousand different influences on that boat all the time. You've got the current coming at you. And sometimes the current, it isn't just a straight line. It's coming from different ways. And you got other boat traffic. And so there's, there's waves, right? And you got the wind that blows against the boat. And it pushes the boat. And, and there's, I mean, there's, a, there's 101 different things that is influencing that boat as you're navigating it up or down the, the, the body of water that you're on. And as you're piloting that boat, you have to make a thousand little micro adjustments. You're constantly, I mean, how many of you have driven a boat, you just point it in the direction you want to go and take your hands off the wheel or take your hands off the tiller? You know what's going to happen? Ring. So you're constantly, constantly adjusting that, that tiller or, or the steering wheel to keep that boat going the direction you want it to go. It's the same with our spiritual life. We're li it, to live a repentant life means that we're constantly making micro adjustments. You know, we get up out of bed, we get it going about our day and it, we're running late. And we get a stinky attitude and somebody cuts us off in traffic or we're dealing with a construction up on 220 and, and you have to say, oh, I need to, okay, I'm sorry, Lord. I need to shut my mouth. I mean, we're constantly dealing with influences that require us to adjust. And that's what it means to live repentantly, to live in a way that says, not my will, but your will, Lord. Not my way, but your way. Isaiah 30, 15 says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance... And rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. And Acts 3.19 says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing may come from the Lord. As we sing our invitation hymn, I want to ask you, is God calling you to repentance this morning? Is the Lord reaching out in his amazing love and his amazing grace and saying, you're going the wrong direction, child? 
You're headed in the wrong way and it's going to hurt you. Turn. Come back to me. Come my way so that you can be forgiven and be saved and have eternal life. If God is calling you to that this morning, I pray and I plead that you'll respond. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together. <laughs>